Order is really important to me. Uh, order should be important to you. Order is important. Uh, as a father, it's important. It's important that when a man wants to start dating my daughter that he would not just sneak her away from the house and just start whispering sweet things into her ear. Or that he wouldn't just ask for her hand in front of a whole youth and family group without ever talking to me. But that there would be order. That he would come and talk to me first. There's order to everything. There's order to birth. There's order to theology. Uh, when I first came here 11 and a half years ago, I had order in what I wanted to teach you. If you were to go to a new church and you were one of the teachers, what would be the first thing you'd teach? What would be the first topic? This would apply to all of you. Let's say, well, you said I'm not a teacher. What if you're going to do small group? What would be the first topic? Okay, the gospel. Anybody else? It's a big question. I've been to at least six or seven churches, started working, and the first thing that I've started with is the nature and attributes of God and his decree, which is the gospel. I want people to start with the nature and attributes of God. I want them to know who he is. And right there, I went right into the fear of God. My favorite biblical topic, my funeral text, we talked about that last week. Knowing the fear of God, we persuade men. The, oh, ooh, me. And then the second thing uh, that I wanted, I would teach, and I taught here was hermeneutics. How do you not only study the Bible, but how do you interpret it? Because that's where we are this morning. And then the third thing was peacemaking principles. Because what's in the church is a bunch of stinkers who don't relate real well to each other, who have conflict resolution. And so I taught on peacemaking. Those are my orders. So the first thing I taught was nature and attributes of God and his gospel. Second was with the fear of God, that was a topic. That order was important. I needed you to know hermeneutics. Most of you weren't here five years ago when we started this, so hermeneutics might be new to you. Hermeneutics. Do you recognize the name Hermes? Her, who's Hermes? Yes. Wow, very good. The Greek God of messages. This is a Greek God, small g, not a real God, but in Greek mythology. He, it, it was his job to go to God and go to man and give messages from God to man, and if man did it right, maybe messages from man to God. He was an intermediator. So hermeneutics is the taking of God's word and bringing it down to man's understanding. This is important. This was the second thing I taught when I came to New Life. Because the, when I go to different churches, when I look at different Protestant denominations and their emphasis, this is where many people go sideways. I was converted to a church that had a hermeneutic that prophecy still exists, that inspiration still exists, and that people could have the word of knowledge directly from God and speak equally as the Bible, and you could not question what they were saying because it was prophecy. It was interpreted through another person, and it was equal to Scripture. And that, that made it very difficult if someone said, well, we had this very handsome teacher of single adult group, and four or five girls all heard the word of God that they were to marry him. But he was not Mormon. That was a problem. How do you interpret Scripture? Well, what's our topic today? And this is fascinating to me. When I talk about order, why did R.C. Sproul do chapter two? Chapter, what was chapter one? Now, this, we're, not talking, we're not talking nature, attributes of God, works and decrees of God, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, human beings in the fall. We're talking number one, Revelation. In Revelation, chapter sub point two of Revelation is three words. What are the words? Yes. 
paradox, mystery. Thank you for that order, because you have them right. You must have read it, and you've also been under this five years ago, if not ten years ago and five years ago and now. This is your third time through. Say the words. Paradox. paradox. Mystery. mystery. So you know what a paradox is, right? Paradox is when Ben Casey meets Dr. Kildare. Now, if you laughed at that, you're at least 50 years old. Okay. Only one guy. Did you, did you catch that? Okay. I, I, you're probably not 50. So the question is, what's a, a paradox, what's a mystery, and what's a contradiction? And right here is how my ministry changed. Right here is how I started with October Letters. So if you know anything about me, if I had to say one word of my ministry, it would be equipping the saints. Equip, which happened to be our word this year for DSO. Equip. My word before that was educate. I thought it was my job to be an educator to make sure people understood, you know, revelation, nature and attributes of God, works and decrees of God. I, I thought it was my job to educate people. But at a different time, in a different place, my wife and I spent most of our life educating junior hires and high schoolers, sent them off into college, and in October we got letters from them. They'd been there two weeks in August, all of September, and by October they were giving us letters that they didn't believe the Bible was the inerrant word of God, they didn't believe that scripture was infallible, they believed that their Theology teachers were wiser than their pastors at home, and those theology teachers, either through German higher criticism or Bardian theology or even a blending of Eastern religions, had a greater understanding than their pastors and their parents and illuminated them into higher understanding. And many of them made shipwreck of their faith. Or many of them who hadn't yet owned their faith, hadn't made profession of faith, just fell away from the faith. And it was disastrous to me. And I, from that, I came to this understanding of mystery, paradox, and contradiction. So this chapter is huge. If I could, I'd take three Sundays on this. I would take one just on paradox, one just on mystery, and I'd take one and I'd blast you out of the classroom on contradiction. This is huge. It's, if Peter Jones were here, one of our elders, he would start ranting and raving right now because this is, the, this is the foundation of what he's been trying to warn us in all these years. This Zen Buddhist, this irrational thinking, this higher understanding, what is in our public education, what is on TV, what is in the Disney movies, I see it everywhere I go, it's in the Marvel movies, this whole new concept of elevated realism, elevated unrealism, elevated understanding, irrationality, is being bought by everybody. Young men going around thinking they're gods, jumping off buildings and breaking collarbones and shattering legs because they've seen it in video. I've been in the hospital with them and realized, hey, you're not Superman, are you? No. Well, I got to tell you, I, gosh, do I dare say I grew up in the 60s? I was a hippie. I had a ponytail. I had little sticks burning all the time wherever I went, in my VW van or at home. I, I, loved, this, I loved the intrigue of new truth. My dad was an engineer and very square and very bright and very logical. And I remember the first time I told him something I heard at college. <laughs> One of the first times I saw my dad just laugh. My dad wasn't prone just to laughing out loud. He was an engineer. <laughs> and I came home and said, Dad, I heard the most awesome truth. The sound, I had, I had to say it right, the sound of one hand clapping. He said, pardon me? I said, just think of the sound of one hand clapping. And he just laughed. And I thought, oh, how square. He missed it. He missed this higher understanding, this, this search for truth 
And, you know, it was in the 60s, yes, but isn't it still going on now? One of my favorite movies, right at this weird scene, he goes, no mind, no mind. They have too many minds, no mind, no mind. You know the movie? Yeah. Let's walk around with no mind. <laughs> I tried that when I had mind-altering experiences. It's nonsense. It might be profound. It might be deep. It's definitely intriguing, but it's absurdity. And I hope you understand that. It's, uh, here's a, from R.C. Sproul. He says, an irrash ir irrationality is a type of mental chaos and I add to it, it's a seductive path that leads to confusion. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, Confusion is of the devil. Have you ever been confused? I find that some teachers are confusing. There's a couple guys on YouTube I've been following, studying, and then they come to a conclusion, I go, well, that's absurd, that's irrational, that doesn't make sense, that didn't follow your logic, didn't follow your points, he just grabbed some absurd truth so he could finish with a strong conclusion. And that is so prevalent today in our thinking. That's why I'm trying to get you to think. As a person thinks, so he is. So confusion is not always a good thing. Confusion is muddying the waters. It is a contradiction. Turn to James chapter 3. I just want you to see this because this is so precious. James 3. You know, James, the half-brother of Jesus. James is, he's a brutal fellow, brutal writer. He just speaks the truth, says it. You know, he's not a politician at all. But he, he just, you know, he's jumping right into hard topics. But James 15 well, let's go James 13. Two kinds of wisdom, because that's what we're talking about, wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Okay, anyone raise your hand. Who's wise and has understanding among you? A lot of you, but you wouldn't raise your hand. We had Brian, because we had, you do, we had you up here doing teaching. Brad, you do, we have you. You know, there's a number of pastors and elders here who have understanding, men who are wise. Let him show it by his what? Good life. That's why I just read you part of lessons we see. I'd rather see a lesson than hear one any day. I may misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in, what's the first one? Humility that comes from wisdom. Oh, man. I'm raising Aaron differently than I did Lucas. When Lucas came out of the womb, a manual didn't come with him. And when I did go read a couple of manuals, men, you know, give him everything he wants, tell him he's entitled, discipline him, drive the, drive the childishness out of him, or I mean, drive the foolishness out of him, but not the childishness. I mean, wow, how do you parent? Now that I'm on number three, I'm getting a little wiser. Think of, you know, Boston Braver, well, I don't know, number 17 or whatever. He's probably really wise. Deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, now watch carefully. This wisdom, because there are mockers amongst us, there are people, that's why I hate mockers. I don't want you guys to be mockers. Don't sit there and... Just go, oh, the bad sermon, that was a joke, can't believe Ted said that, I can't believe Rip said that. I have you stand up, I have you articulate, I have you stand and deliver, that way you realize, whoa, this is hard to do. It's hard to go from here to out here. So we want you to engage a watching world. Well, that wisdom, such wisdom that's bitter and is full of ambition and boast, this wisdom does not come from heaven, but it is, notice three things, it's what? earthly, it's unspiritual, and it's, it's demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder, disorder. I, what's the word I started with today? Order. And every evil practice. But, verse 17, 
The wisdom that comes from heaven is first pure, peace-loving. That's the third thing I taught, peacemaking principles. Considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace and raise a harvest of righteousness. I need you to know, if you, if you can catch anything in all of that, there's two kinds of wisdom. There's godly wisdom. There's demonic wisdom. There's a demonic wisdom which we saw all this last month. If you went to the movies at all and saw any of the trailers that, that was out there, most of that was demonic wisdom. There is godly wisdom that comes from above and it's done in humility and love and peace. And so when we begin to talk about paradox, mystery, and contradiction, know that there are those people who want you to come and have order in your mind, understanding in your mind, systematic understanding in your mind, systematic theology, so that you can think clearly, so that you'll have a foundation so that when the world comes against you, troubles come against you, you'll have a foundation of where you shall not be moved in your thinking. Because the devil wants to come to you with confusion and new stories and new illustration. Now why am I laboring this? Because you're all going to get it when you go to college. Your parents are going to get the bill and you're going to get newer thinking. <laughs> and it's my job to make sure none of you are October letters. Because I can't handle that anymore. One of the greatest terms I found on the University of YouTube lately was exalted irrationality. It was a goal in Eastern cults. Exalted irrationality. Think about that. It's almost like the sound of one hand clapping. Well, what is a paradox? A paradox is, a, and this is a key word, it's an apparent contradiction that under close scrutiny yields resolution. Let me say it again, because there's a difference between a paradox and a contradiction. You know what a contradiction is? You probably had it many times in parenting or as a student or as a child. A contradiction is a violation of the law of non-contradiction. It is impossible to resolve either by morals or by God, either in this world or the next. It's irreconcilable. That's a contradiction. A paradox is an apparent contradiction that under close scrutiny yields resolution. One of my first students who heard of German higher criticism off at a college, a denominational college that we sent him to, wrote back and says, you know what? I know the Bible is not the Word of God. I said, really? How's that? He said, well, in one account of the resurrection, there's one angel at a tomb, and another, there's two angels. So our teacher said, see, there's, there's an error in the Bible. And I go, wow, I never even caught that before. Really? So I went and looked at the text. Oh, okay. So I ran to Dennis Johnson, Dr. Johnson. And he goes, well, I'm just curious. Rip, when you drive past Highway 70, you see an accident, what do you usually see? And I said, me? Man, I, I see the skid marks. I see which way the marks are. Does it hit black, start with black, and then fade off, which means he was this way? Or, and I can look at the car and say, did that one hit first? I just study it. My wife just goes and goes, oh, my wife goes, oh, dear Jesus, closes her eyes, doesn't even look at the skid marks, doesn't look at which corner got hit, what? She just closes her eyes and starts praying for the people. Pretty cool. <laughs> I've learned that lesson from her. I want to see where, how, why, when. I'm the son of an engineer. You have two different men who are there. One man sees two angels. One man sees one. Is that a scribal error? Is that a problem in the scripture? Didn't we all grow up hearing about the blind men that come up to an elephant? An elephant is a wall. A guy, an elephant's a fire hose. An elephant's a tree trunk. An elephant, you know. And so I'll never forget this class I took at Westminster Seminary on studying scripture. It shook me at my core because it dealt with some of these contradictions, some of these mysteries some of these seemingly paradoxical things. I didn't like the class because I was just a simple biblicist. I just like to believe the Bible and believe everything. But it dealt with some of the 
seemingly questionable problems in the text, and it, that class, though it shook me at my core when I finished, I had such a deep understanding and appreciation for Scripture that I knew that God, the Word of God was inerrant and infallible. And I wouldn't suggest that class for anybody because it's kind of like, whoa, it's like looking at the emperor's new clothes and then having to put it back on. How many people have had that class? David, you've had that class. Is that a hard class for you? Which class? Uh, biblical interpretation, which now they call it something else. Oh, uh, yeah, it's kind of changed into different class. Do you find it hard? I remember certain points where you start going, like, oh, I never considered that kind of thing. Yeah. But it's good to consider it. It's good to consider all things, and that's what we're doing in this class. So, for example, uh, when it comes to a paradox, what a seemingly contradiction, can you think of a paradox in Scripture? I, I came up with like 40. What is Spurgeon's door? That was one of the greatest illustrations that I heard. So Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he's a Reformed Baptist, and he's trying to tell you that in Scripture, there are sometimes perspectives that God, he allows us to open up and just see a little bit of his infinite. The finite cannot grasp the infinite. We'll never be able to grasp God. We'll never be able to completely understand who he is and what he's doing. He wants us to walk by... Oh, I want to walk by sight. I want to know where I'm going. But you know what? I'm not God. I can't do it. He wants me to walk by faith and not by sight. And there are sometimes my faith is difficult. And yet he gives us pictures every now and then. So what is Spurgeon's door in the area of soteriology, in the area of salvation, in the area of coming to Christ? On one side of the door it says, Come all ye who will. On the other side, it says, cyclist ahead. <laughs> oh. On the other, it says, no man shall come to Christ unless he's drawn, unless he's wooed. Both are true. When I had my first class at Westminster Seminary and the J.I. Packer was my professor, I'll, the thing I remember most was, number one, his compassion with a fool, if you know that story, and two, this, he said, any students, if you're going to be a mature Christian, you have to hold two things in tension all the time. Never rest. Always holding two things in tension. The justice of God. The mercy of God. You have to be careful where you put your emphasis and on what syllable. Is it on God's sovereignty and man's responsibility? Can you hold the two in tension? So he wrote that famous book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. Evangelism and the sovereignty of God, and how they work together. That's a seeming paradox. No man comes to know the Lord unless he's drawn. All men come. Universal call, effectual call. We'll be coming to that if you haven't heard it. Philippians 2, uh, 12b and 13. Worker, yes, let me get some of, do we have a Dutchman in here? Who's a Dutchman in here? We're married to a Dutch woman. Oh, there you go. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I could stop right there and beat you over the head with it. Is that biblical? It was scripture. Hermeneutics, did I keep it in context? What's the second part? For it is God who works within you, both to do and to will of his good pleasure. Isn't that a paradox? You're telling me to work. You're telling me to work my, out my salvation with fear and trembling. Fear. Ooh. Ooh. Me. Not, ta not terror and dread. You're working out your salvation with, but know this. So that's, what does Westminster teach you? The imperative and the indicative. What's the imperative? What does that mean? Oh, you're studying Greek and Hebrew at the same time. Are you coming or going? Are you left or right? No. <laughs> What's imperative? Imperative is what God tells you to do. Imperative is a command. Indicative is? It's the basis on which the commands are. So it's who God is and what he has done for us. It's the basis of, wow, that's the basis of what has. So Romans 1 through 11, the indicative. What Christ has done for us. What he's done for us. We are unable to do it. He does it. 
He empowers us. He enables us. Therefore, command, chapter 12, considering the mercies of God, present your bodies. Why do you present your bodies? Because he's working and doing and empowering. He's done all this for you. If you're law-based, you'll go right to chapter 12 or chapter 4 in Ephesians or chapter 3 in Colossians. If you're law-based, you'll go right to the commands. But one thing I learned that's valuable is the indicative, the indicative drives the imperative. Do you hear that? Who you are in Christ, what he's done for you, drives you. It's not that you have to obey and grunt and obey and grunt and obey. Oh, I, oh this is such a wonderful life. It's that I deserve hell. He lived a perfect life that I couldn't live. He gives his righteousness to me. He covers my sin. He turns away the wrath of the Father. He works within me and motivates me out of the love and the fear of God to love him and serve him. He's so awesome. I just want to serve him. The imperative drives. The indicative drives the imperative. Who you are in Christ drives what you are. Does that seem like a paradox? We have to hold these things in tension. That's why some denomination will just go, ah, it's only law. Do it. Do it. Christian moralism. Over here you have the other extreme. Oh, just you know, do whatever you want. Antinomianism. And we're in the middle going, Philippians 2, 12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But as you are working it out, know this, know this with a smile. It's he who works within you, both to do and to will. Don't fret. Don't be anxious. Don't worry. Because he's going to do it. Even if you're like me, Balaam's ass, sitting on his haunches going, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go visit them. I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't like that person. I will find myself drawn to them. And if I don't get to the hospital, like just happened last week because I said, you know what, that person slandered me. They hate me. They talk bad about me. I'm not going to go to the hospital. Great pastor. Guess who I saw? in Vaughn's Market on crutches. <laughs> I go, oh, wow, how are you? Fine, you didn't come and visit me. I said, no, you know, I guess we've been having problems. Yeah, we have, and we talked out the problems right there at Vaughn's, and there was a misunderstanding. I cried and said, hey, would you please don't think, don't think about this incident anymore. Don't bring it up and use it against me. Don't talk to others about it. Don't allow it to stand between us and hinder our relationship. And the person just cried and said, you know what? I really have done disservice to you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And I go, yeah, what a great day in Vons. And we both sat there in Vons, and we were hugging and crying. This lady goes by and goes, can I help you guys? <laughs> and I was embarrassed and go, I no. She goes, you okay? I go, we're okay. Two old friends. And then I look at him, and I go, wow, we're old friends? He goes, you just lied to her. <laughs> I said, you're a pastor. And I go, I lied to everybody. I'm sorry, but how about we start a friendship? God in his providence brought that person to me. Even if I'm on my haunches, even if I'm going, I won't do it. God wants resolution. Do you hear that? Our God is working for us and in us for his good pleasure. Whew. You know, there are things in nature we cannot understand. Science has a lot of contradictions. They call them mysteries. Can you truly understand motion? Can you truly understand gravity? In my, in my physics class, being a son of a very successful engineer, I drove my teacher nuts because I wanted proof. And I didn't want his presuppositions. I wanted proof, measurable proof. And they couldn't give it to me. Motion and Gravity will still be argued, I think, till the day we are. Can we penetrate God? Can the finite grasp the infinite? My favorite part of this comes from Job. You're laughing, you're my students. What is Job's greatest position? What is his greatest stance? Everybody, take your right hand, unless you're left handed. Take your support, take your firing hand and put it over your mouth and just go like this. Brian, you're not doing it. There you go. Thank you. You know what? If you catch the Hebrew, Job comes up and he questions God. <laughs> and at the end of his question, how does God address him? 
What name does he call him? Where are you, O man? And what is the man representing? Where are you, O created one? When I, where were you when the winds came out of the, where were you when the waves, where were you, O man, O created? I mean, where were you, O man, O created? When, and Job's kind of going, oh, I got into an argument I shouldn't have done. <laughs> I'm talking to the creator who knows where the winds and the mysteries and the clouds and the waves come from. He knows the depths of the sea. I'm, he keeps calling me this name, O man, which means O created one. Well, I guess the creation creator distinction comes to mind. We hear that in seminary a lot. Creator creature distinction. And so what does Job do? He puts his hand over his mouth. That is a great position. My mom one time, in anger, said to my dad, You see, why are you always right? I hate it. You're always right, because my mom wasn't. My mom wanted to be an authority and acted like one, but many times she just wasn't. God bless her. My dad was almost always right, but he had a motto. He said, well, really simple, Lou. When I know something, I speak about it gently, but confidently. And when I don't know, I don't say anything, and I just listen and learn. And I went, wow, was that wisdom? And isn't that Job? What's some of the best stance? I try to teach Aaron and Lucas and Ian. When they ask you a question you don't know, you say, I don't know, but I'll look into it. What's wrong with that? Why did so many years I have to go, uh, I have to come up with an answer, make an answer? That's demonic. That's earthly. That's worldly. One of the most best answers is, hey, you know, Luke, what's the difference between superlapsarian and infralapsarian? Tell me now. But I'll look into it. Say that. Okay, David, you can teach him on it. Isn't that precious? Let us have this position of, of, uh, of Job. Not being able to understand does not warrant a blind leap into irrationality and absurdity. When I went to Orange Coast College in Southern California, I wish someone had written this. I have it bold in your handout, which you'll get next week. Not being able to understand does not warrant a blind leap into irrationality and absurdity. But that's what people are doing right now. If you don't understand, you know, I'm going to a new university. You know what my new university is? YouTube. University of YouTube. And man, I have to listen to him and listen to her and listen to this and listen to that. And it's, I have to, a lot of seating and weeding and taking notes. But after I come, I, I, I found the best, I found the best ukulele teacher. I found the best motorcycle dual sport rider. I found the best guy in car mechanics. And I found the best guy that tells me how to minister to millennials. I'm weeding, I'm learning, I'm listening. And that's what I hope you're doing with life. I hope you're really distil distilling and discerning. Well, let me just conclude with this. We need hermeneutics, and it's not a part of our Sunday school program. Would you Google hermeneutics and just see some of the basic hermeneutical principles? Can you name one? Can anyone name a hermeneutical principle? I gave you one last week. Yes? Scripture interprets scripture. Oh, scripture interprets scripture. Illustration? Um, if you come to a portion of scripture that seems contradictory, um, you can uh, search for other scripture that speaks to that scripture, something from the Old Testament spoken to from the New Testament that helps explain it. There are a few scriptures that say, mark these people, have nothing to do with them. Other scriptures that might say, love one another. Okay, everybody up here, that's just a distraction. Pay no attention to the man behind the screen. <laughs> Pay no attention to the two men behind the screen. Okay, I've lost them. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, for all that you do. Scripture will talk about marking those who have caused division have nothing to do with them. Another scripture might say, love everybody. You have to take the scriptures and compare them. That's what we do with the Trinity, isn't it? That's what we do with all kinds of things. Context is important. I gave you one last week. Judas went and hung himself. 
Judas went and hung himself. That's scripture. Go therefore and do likewise. That's scripture. Do it. Okay. There's historical context. There's, so look at, look at this because many times, as some will tell you, there's contradictions in scripture. There are not. There are seemingly paradoxes. God's justice, God's mercy come together perfectly at the cross. There are mysteries, things that we just not understand. I will not understand Spurgeon's door. I will not understand Philippians 2, 12 and 13. I, God is gracious enough to give us a picture. But there, I cannot grasp the finite, cannot grasp the infinite. I cannot get the mind of Christ. But I do have the mind of Christ. How about this? 2 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural man does not understand the things of God. their foolishness to him because he does not have the mind of Christ. But it has been given to us. All right? So, Thomas is telling me I'm going taking too long. Thank you, Thomas. In conclusion, there are seemingly paradoxical things in the Bible. You study them, you'll come to this un understanding. There are mysteries in the Bible that you'll never understand. 1 Corinthians talks about the mystery of the gospel. How can God come to earth? The mystery to the Greeks is that the foolishness of the cross makes sense to us, but it's foolishness to them. Those are mysteries. But let me just say this, from history and theologians who are solid, they'll tell you there's not one contradiction in Christian theology in the Bible. There is another Bible that other people are putting out, not Christian, and they're like Kingdom of the Colts and Walter Martin and others will show you how there are hundreds of contradictions from one edition to another in their Bibles. The Bible does not have one contradiction, even with the new scrolls that have been produced new manuscripts. No, not one theological contradiction has come in Christianity. It's the Word of God. There's is the Word of God, but hundreds of contradictions. So let me just say three words. There seems to be, what's the first one? Starts with a P? Paradox. Paradox. Apparent contradictions, but they're not contradictions. You have to study and look at them. One angel, two angels. Two different views. Two different people, two different Gospels, two different workings. There are mysteries that we'll never understand. Job finally saw the mysteries of the waves and the wind, and, the, and he just, <laughs> whoa, whoa. Creator-creature distinction. And in contradictions, there are none in the Bible. Find any, I'll give you $1,000. That's about all I have in savings but I'll gladly give it to you if you can find a contradiction. David, you close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity of it. That though we could spend lifetimes digging into the depths, yet it, your gospel is abundantly clear even to babes. Father, would you open our eyes and our hearts to dig all the more deeply into your word and be blessed by it. That as we treasure your truths, our hearts and our lives would be more and more conformed to the image of your Son. Father, we thank you for this day of, of rest and of worship when we can gather as the body of Christ, your bride, this tiny foretaste of heaven. Lord, would you bless this day the world over and your ministers as they bring your word to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Memory work. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Look at chapter 4. We're going to skip 3.